Tribe, we're going to bring you another episode from our Becoming Your Own Banker book series that Joey and I did in 2019. This is part seven. And man, I was getting ready to cut out the intro to this that that existed, you know, four years ago, but it's just too funny. I'm going to let you have it as well as we just got a new dog. And so I'm going through all the same issues. You'll know what I mean. A lot of fun. This episode is action packed on the human problems. If you've ever been taught things by your parents financially that now you're questioning why, you know, why am I doing it that way? Um, if you've ever overspent on your finances and you've wondered why this episode is going to cover it. And lastly, there's a major insight within this episode as to why Joey and I hate, I mean, H-A-T-E, qualified plans. Let's jump in right now to the book series, part seven of Becoming Your Own Baker. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome, this is the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Your host, Joey, the Italian Stallion Murray, joined as always by Russ, the Idea Guy, Morgan. So Russ, we are finally in chapter seven, excuse me, not chapter seven, part seven of our review of Nelson Nash's classic book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And up to this point, as Nelson says on page 28, we have thus far covered only the technical aspects of creating your own banking system through dividend paying life insurance. Now, we must face the human problems. <laughs> you said that with a deep voice. Well, I mean, that's for effect. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, the human part of this is definitely a big thing and we can't skip this right now though, Joey, I've got some, we all have human problems, Russ. Well, we have human problems, but in my house right now, we got some canine problems. Ooh. Yeah. Please. So we have this French pointer is what I lovingly refer to him as, cause I don't want to use his, um, sissy name, which is called a Baroque Francais. <laughs> I see why you call him a French pointer. Yeah, he's got a little, I mean, you, when you see or hear. Especially as a dude. I mean, he's a, he's not a female dog. I no, mean, he's, he's, well, we, we just had him fixed. So he's kind of a tween, <laughs> he's a tweener at this point. <laughs> but, I mean, I mean. Poor guy. I mean, Baroque Francais. Like, seriously, like, this yeah. guy have like a beret on, like some sort of like purple flowers, like tucked in his ear. This is not good. Yeah. That's why I say French pointer. I mean, but. Baroque. I literally went almost Baroque buying the dog. He's an expensive dog. That's why they call him that. Yeah. Yeah. Expensive dog. And up to this point, he's done about $2,000 of damage to the backyard of our house. Oof. Yeah. He literally ate my irrigation system. That's, that's, that's doing work. Right? Yeah. He, he went, he went to town on that <laughs> and everything else that, that lives back there has almost died because of him. So anyway, we're at this point, we're like, okay, we got to let the dog just run. And we're, so we're down at the lake and I just let the dog out of the cage the other day. I was like, let's just see what happens. He takes off like a bolt of lightning. He jumps off the driveway, which goes down into a ravine like a deer. I mean, it's just like, zoom, and he's just gone. I mean, he's running like the dog from Funny Farm. If you've ever seen the movie Funny Farm with Chevy Chase, you know what I'm talking about. Dog just takes off, runs, never comes back. Well, this one ended up coming back. <laughs> well, this morning I drove back into the office to be here with you mm, so that we could you. record. Thank you for doing that. I've been gone less than four hours. I get a text from my wife. Okay, sell the dog. <laughs> <laughs> she done. I'm like, what? What's happened? So I won't go through everything. Please don't judge Megan because I, from the beginning, said, so let's get rid of this dog. I think she's, I've, I've worn her down at this point. So she in her text says to me, we just released him and think, well, he may not come back. And at the end of the day, do we care if he does it? <laughs> The kids don't like him. We have enough problems. <laughs> it's not working out. It's not working out. That sounds like um, a phone call I may have received in high school from <laughs> yeah. a girl. And yeah, yeah, it's not, not working out. There. She like broke up with her dog via text, and that's, that's what just happened there. I mean, it, this is but this is the thing. So we have problems, and as a, a, a transition into our <laughs> topic for the day, human problems. 
It, this is an area early on when I read this book, I got to be honest, I skipped over this super fast. Me too. I, like I started 100%. reading like, what, what, why am I reading about some British, you know, guy named Parkinson? What's Willie Sutton have to do with this whole concept? Exactly. Let me get to the numbers. Let me, let me figure out how can I use a life insurance policy and does it really work? And let me see the, uh, the intricate parts so I can try to figure out, you know, is it, could I do it or do I need to like disregard this whole thing? And it wasn't until maybe like the fifth or sixth reading of this to when I realized the infinite wisdom that Nelson Nash had by putting in these human problems or the behavioral part of economics that we cannot undo. That's right. Yeah, I, I thought it was really just a bunch of fluff, to be honest with you, like you said. And, but the more we do this as practitioners of this process, we realize that we're the problem. Yeah. We, we could be the biggest part of this problem. Why, why do you think that is, though? What like, do you mean? Why, why are we the problem? Because of the things he's going to mention here, right? Because we overspent. Because we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. So where does that come from? Well, I guess it's because the way we were raised. It, it is, who is our financial teachers growing up? Our parents. Our parents. And I love my parents, but most of our parents were not, they were not taught finances. Who are they taught by? Their parents. And so forth parents. and so on. And so the financial IQs that a lot of us have, we, we, we come to this point in life, no matter how successful we are today, we come from the information and education that our parents passed down. And regardless of how financially astute our parents were, right? Because they, they probably weren't taught into the things. They're, they were not probably in communities like we are. Some of them were, but as a vast majority of the people we meet, the things that we bring to the table, I mean, you, you see this all the time. You read books that says, oh, what, the way you act and react to things goes back to when you were five or six years old. Yeah. It, it starts at that point. Exactly. And, and so we are bringing that to the table. So when we're learning about things, we're talking about money, the the key part that we can't disregard is the human problems. And these are things that are deep down inside of us. Yeah, no doubt. And, and so Nelson points out these key aspects and it's not things that we are brand new to us. It's not things that are like, you know, lightning strikes our head. Oh, I didn't, I never knew that. Yeah. But he definitely points out the reason why we have to um, get these things in check. Well, if you got, you got to bring it to the for forefront, right? I mean, the things you, you hear people talking about having vision boards, things that uh, goals and objectives, things that they want to hit, whether it's losing weight, whether it's, you know, achieving a certain a status or whatever it may be, driving a specific car, whatever it is, they have these vision boards, you put it in front of you and your subconscious starts working toward that. Well, if we don't put these human problems in this book that we refer to as our financial Bible, if you will, yeah. that, that it would not, we, we would disregard them. So having them in here. So let's jump into the first one. The first one is understanding Parkinson's law. So tell us about Parkinson. All right. So, so Parkinson identified that there are certain aspects of the human nature that have to do with time or space. And so the first one, he says that work will rise to equal time. So the, the time allotted. So this is a perfect example. You give somebody a job and you say, get it done in the next three days. Well, when do you think they're going to get it done? In that third day. Yeah, at the end of the third day, probably. But if you give them 10 days to do the same job, guess how long it's going to take them to get it done? 10 days. 10 days. We've all done it. How many times did you have a project in high school and the teacher says, hey, you know, you have to have this, you know, you know the little foldable boards that you a have little to science have. project. The science project. Yeah. I was always up the night before with my dad <laughs> grudgingly helping me put together glue stuff, whatever. It took me up until the last minute. So that's why that becomes a law. It didn't have to be, but it's like if I drop my phone and it hits the ground, that's the law of gravity, right? Over and over again, repeats it, it becomes a law. So right. Isn't that what kind of Parkinson, this like British SAS lecturer would basically say is that when you give somebody a job and it, and you give them a time allotted, that the time will actually grow to equal the allotted amount. That's right. And, and the same thing will be true with money. That's if, right. you, if you say, okay, well, I'm going to make $100,000 a year. How much will somebody spend? $100,000. <laughs> the, the expenses will rise to equal income. It, exactly. So it's, it is that kind of fulfillment. The demand will, will rise to equal the supply of that allotted, whatever that issue is. That's right. And the last thing he applies is luxury. 
right? He said, a luxury once enjoyed becomes a necessity. Now, we've all experienced something like that. Nelson used to always talk about in his, um, in his seminars how he got bun warmers. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. called them bun warmers in a car, a nice car. You know, you had the heated seats. Oh, yeah, you can't he go said, back He that. said, you're never going back. Yeah. You're always going to get bun warmers in the next car. And now when you get the ones with air conditioning in them, <laughs> and when you live in Alabama, the South, like the air conditioning. In I mean, the you, seat, you're talking about. Yeah, in yeah. the seat. Well, you remember as a kid, oh, like getting, getting, getting in the car, you know, like getting on those. I think we'd have a lever seat, leather yeah. seats in our, they had those vinyl seats. <laughs> Uh, you got the short shorts on as a little Ooh. kid, you know, back in the day and just like peeling skin. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's painful. Now, you know a little bit about um, luxury items, don't you, Russ? <laughs> what, are you, what are you saying? Well, when I, I, I know <laughs> one thing that I have personally enjoyed at one point that I never can go back from, and that is a fitted shirt. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, that, I, had, I had a friend of mine that introduced me to this 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 group that will come and actually tailor your little dress shirts. I, I like to dress nice. Okay. I, guilty is charged. Yeah. It's an obsession. We and, <laughs> <laughs> and I had all these great shirts that I loved that I would buy from like banana Republic. That was like my go-to place. <laughs> and I mean, I loved them. And then I get this, like a couple fitted, like tailored shirts or whatever. And it actually, you know, cause I'm a tall guy, wide shoulders, but fairly small waist. And so I'd have to buy extra large shirts. So the, the if, if you if you listen to this, just think Mr. Incredible, okay? Just like if you, you can visualize that. So somewhat something similar to that. <laughs> but you know, and to have a long enough shirt that would fit my arms and that would fit my shoulders, it, it would come straight down like a box. Yeah. I, I'd have enough to fit uh, two little kids underneath my arms, basically. Well, sure. And, but you don't notice it until you put on a shirt that actually fits you around the waist. And if you've ever put on a, a pair of clothes that actually fit compared to ones you don't, you're like, ooh, wait a second. So so you're saying it's almost becoming, it's a necessity at this point. Oh, it, it, there's no going back. <laughs> I, I literally gave away every one of those Banana Republic shirts I had. Just so, gave them to somebody. So check the box next to Parkinson's Law that a luxury has become a necessity. Yeah, and that's the whole key to that and what Nelson's saying in this is that we have to be careful. We have to be careful about the luxuries that we are enjoying because it doesn't have to be, but it most likely will become now a necessary part of our life. And as we continue to grow in our income, we're going to have more luxuries enjoyed. And not that that's a bad thing, because you and I are not about this whole, like, spend like no one else so we can live like no one else concept. Yeah, I, I've heard that somewhere else. Yeah, I, I'm not over it. But here's the thing is that we've also talked about the book, The, uh, the Richest Man of Babylon. Yeah. And it, his concept of being able to live off 70% of everything we bring in. Well, if my income is constantly rising, then that means my expenses can continue to rise as long as I try to keep at that 70% mark. Right. Keep the percentages in line. Right. That, that makes all the difference. Now, what Nelson says, if you can whip this, you can win by default because your peers can't do it. And that's going to be a repeating theme within these human problems that he goes back to over and over again is that everything that we do is compared to those around us. That's right. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention on this is when we, one of the negatives potentially of infinite banking is that we start off with a policy and we're funding it. And it is maybe to that 20 or 30% of our income potentially that we talked about in the richest man in Babylon. However, as our income increases and even maybe our rider has dropped off, now we're at a much lower percentage of our overall income. And we're not, we're not keeping up with this and by not increasing the policies that we have. Well, increasing our savings is a, a problem nationwide. You, you find this is that people who go out and they seek financial help, they go out and find someone to be an advisor to them, to help them through the process. And so they've been doing little or nothing up to that point. They're like, oh, I need to be saving $100,000 a year or $50,000 a year or $500,000, whatever their number is. Okay, great. And they start doing that. Well, then they peg that number and they never change it. That's right. Their income keeps rising. The government keeps printing money. So our dollar's worth less every single year. Yet they have not increased the amount of money that they're doing. So I think that the point that you're making is, as we see that within our client base, you start a policy. Now that amount that you're putting in that one specific policy is fixed. 
So sometimes I get the question, Russ, why do you have 19 life insurance policies? Well, one is that my income has continued to rise. And so if I'm going to continue to try to put away a percentage of my income, I need to have a place to put it. That one policy I started because we set it up as to the max level that it could uh, hold. Right. I've had to start new ones. And so there's a good point that he's pointing here is that we can't get so fixated with taking every dollar that comes in and spending it. We've got to have a, a gauge there, but also we got to be prepared to make sure we start saving more and more and have a plan to do it. Right. All right. So that's Parkinson's law. Second one he covers is Willie Sutton's law. This is on page 29. So Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber. Yeah. And once uh, he was interviewed and they said, well, Willie, why in the world do you keep robbing banks? He said, that's where they keep the money. <laughs> Like shocker. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think when so I, what's the law behind that? Well, when I think of Willie Sutton and start talking about the, the a theft, you know, the legal theft that we have in our country comes straight from the IRS. I mean, they the produce that you and I have, the production, our income is constantly being stolen through taxes. Well, it, it's anywhere that you accumulate wealth, someone will try to get their hands on it. And the IRS, like you said, is the best, um, if you say the best, the best thief of that money. They're going to find a way. And so what have they done? They've created places where they can make sure you're accumulating, yeah. like 401ks, like quali tax qualified plans. And you've heard us go on and on about those. Like, yes, we get to defer the tax, but at some point in time, they're going to come a knock in. And at that point, they're going to want the money that they, that you deferred plus the interest on it. So a couple of times we've, you've heard us talk about this specifically is under the tax train. Yep. So if, if you, one, missed our uh, podcast on the tax train is coming, uh, that's a documentary that was done by David McKnight. We have copies of that uh, DVD that we're glad to send you. If you want to send us $10, we'll put it in the mail to you and uh, you can watch it. It's very informative and it talks more about how the future of taxation is going to happen because uh, the IRS needs more money. The well, government needs more money because of the programs that they've created. Yeah, we got way too much in debt out there. We got way too much social programs that are going to demand more and more money as our, our population is aging. That's a big thing that That's we have right. in our country right now is aging. So, yeah, I think it's important to see as he starts talking about this is when we think about where we're going to save and invest money, what is going to be the result from a taxation standpoint? If we get to keep a dollar, if our dollar grows, we get to keep that dollar, the full dollar, and not have to ultimately pay some dollar in tax on it, how much better can we be? And, and I know that obviously Nelson figured this out, and you've heard us talk about this as one of the reasons why we use life insurance is because these policies were created that predate the 1913 tax laws that where IRS was created, that these things actually have been designed in a way for us to not have the growth on the dollar tax, as well as when we execute it properly, can get the money out without taxes. That's right. One thing I want to bring up that's kind of timely is this most recent the article we just uh, got the other day. And it is, it, the, it's titled, Congress is Coming for Your IRA. Wow. And this is the most blatant recent uh, event, in my opinion, explaining how the government can get access to your gold, right? Um, and so it says, it's, they call this the SECURE Act. Mm. Okay, well, that sounds good, doesn't it, Russ? I mean, the government has a great way of saying They got things. an acronym. They got an acronym. Uh, yeah, so, SECURE. Yeah, SECURE. Um, setting every community up for retirement enhancement. I mean, if I'm looking at that. Sounds good. It's, Where do sign I me up. Vote yes. Yeah, vote yes, right? Now, when you actually look at what's inside the SECURE Act, Russ, um, this is doing away with the stretch IRA. And if you don't know what the stretch IRA was, this is actually a technique when I was back in my investment management days that I use very frequently with some of my older clients who had more money than they were ever going to spend. And we knew if they passed it directly to the next generation, that that generation with their income bracket gets this money, they pay the top tier rate on it. If they were in an estate tax, they get maybe 20 cents on the dollar of it. Yeah. And so like having the ability through 
the, the uh, stretch IRA, or we would call it multi-generational IRA kind of process, we could take that and we could take a little bit out of that account every single year and stretch it. And so we could hopefully pay a smaller rate of taxation on it while allowing the money to continue to stay at work. So it seemed like a good concept. Now, again, I was taught that by mutual fund companies, which <laughs> wanted to keep the money for another hundred years. So I understand what their, their philosophy was behind it. But another side was definitely to try to reduce not having to pay that huge lump sum immediately. Well, in this was just recently, uh, the bill was passed, is that they're doing away with that provision. So no longer can someone leave an IRA other than to a spouse and not have to get all the money out within 10 years. Yeah, so, so let's just practically break that down. If your heirs, your son, daughter, whomever it is, let's say they're making you know, three or $400,000 a year, and now all of a sudden they inherit this $2 million IRA. Now they've got to take an additional 200000 of income from taking that $2 million over 10 years. That throws them immediately in a higher rate. Absolutely. Because right now, I mean, you look at the tax brackets, you could be making a couple hundred thousand dollars if you're married and still be in that kind of 22% range for the federal and, and be doing very well. But all of a sudden, wham, you, you get a million dollar IRA and you have to take out the majority of that uh, every single year. Now you've been pushed up there into the 37%. That's right. And, and so a, a, a significant percentage of that money is now going to be pulled away and it's now being couched in this secure act. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared, though, for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30-second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. And, and the key to this whole thing that I was thought was brilliant in this article is they pointed out that this did not require them to change tax rates. Yep. Right. So how does the government get access to your money? They do it in all sorts of different ways. It doesn't have to be your bracket has changed like, oh, now you were in a 24 percent bracket. Now we're going to make that 48. That would be like an uprising. Like people would say, wait a minute. Well, that's that not fair. Fast, right? Exactly. That's the fast one. It's that slow creeping socialism that we've been dealing with the last hundred years that it's the boiling of the frog. That's right. It happens slowly over time that you don't understand what's going on. And what he's saying within Willie Sutton, why this is an important part, is just we need to be very conscious of where we put in our dollars. It, you know, again, we're not one to tell you all the different places. We obviously use life insurance. We're big fans of that. We like business ownership. We like real estate. All of those things have great tax benefits. Robert Kiyosaki says the E quadrant and the S quadrant pay the highest percentage of taxes of anybody out there is because they are literally operating in the area that got none of the benefits. All, all the business owners and investors, are the ones who've been lobbying Congress for years and years and years. That's right. And so that's why all the deductions and things that happen on their end get, get the most money in their pocket. So we've got to think like them. So if you're operating in an employee sole, sole proprietorship, self-employed mindset, and you're using these IRAs and these other plans that were designed for employees, that were designed to pay the most in taxes, wake up to it. Like, here's what Nelson's saying. Well, Willie uh, Sutton's law is alive and well, and we just need to participate in this knowingly and try to find our way legally to avoid it. Okay. Now there's going to be some haters that hear this and they say, okay, well, I get that everybody's going to come after the gold at some point. Right. And, but at the end of the day, couldn't they do the same thing in a policy, right? If I'm accumulating quote unquote in my policy, what keeps the IRS from taking that money out from there? What, what keeps them from coming back? Well, I yeah. think the, the simplest way to look at that is the, the path of least resistance. 
I mean, right now, I mean, I've got all sort of issues going on. We got dog issues, you know, tearing up. But one of the things that we have is that our pool has experienced some some problems, and we had a leak around the edge of it. And we brought a pool um, contractor to come, and what he what he started telling us like, well, where these pipes were coming out, where you were experiencing a leak, well, that water would have followed the path of least resistance. It wouldn't have tried to push its way out through this hill and go down. It would have literally just followed the simplest thing, which would have been to go back next to the pool cavity and just start working its way around. So imagine like a, a swimming pool or, or a, a tub, if you will, you know, get this, uh, this cavity. He said the water would have just went around it because it would have been the least compact of all the soil that would have existed. Right. That's where the water would have went. So we got potentially an issue there that we, we got a pool that's not perfectly supported because of it. Well, the same thing is true, I would say, in this, is that the government created what? Qualified plans. They created IRAs and 401ks. So they already made an agreement with you that, hey, by the way, we allowed you to defer the taxes. This is a plan we created. We allow you through the plan we created to defer the taxes. And they know that there's about $20 trillion in these IRAs and 401ks. That's with a T. Exactly. <laughs> so they say, you know what? The first step is we're, we're not going to allow you to stretch these. We, we made these plans. We're not, we had this rule. Nah, we take that rule away now because that's their rule. That's they, their plan, right? Mm -hmm. Think about it very simply. So now if they want to come back for taxes on those, do, are they going to go over here and say, okay, I got to go after this money in uh, life insurance policies, which is a contract, which by, by the way, if you start voiding contracts, then everything's off. Oh yeah. That's a, Our that's marriages a are done. nightmare. Like, so that, that's breaking contract law, which they don't want to get into that, but also it's something that was not created. So uh, I use this as a really bad example, but if, if if you had somebody in your house that, that needed money, are they most likely going to go to the neighbor's house, break in their house and go try to find money? Are they going to literally look for money in the, in the house in which they're in? I think they're going to stay, stay at home. It's going to be easier path of least resistance. That's what we're looking at whenever people ask me that question. Can it be possible? Yes. We'll know it's possible once they have completely raided all the money in the IRAs and 401ks. When all that money's gone, then they're going to start going after life insurance money. Most of the people, when they think about life insurance, not the way we do, right? They think about That's life right. insurance as a replacement and that somebody dies, not as a place to store millions and millions of dollars like most of you who are listening to this podcast. So that's not the place. But when people see, you know, these people with several million dollars in IRAs, they go, oh, those greedy jokers, they put all that money over there in those IRAs. Surely, I mean, we're over here starving. We, 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 we can barely live off $15 an hour. I mean, we've got to get some of that money for our SECURE Act. That's right. And that's why it's going to get couched. So will it happen? Maybe. But I can tell you, what's the path of least resistance? It's going to go after what they've already created, not to try to attack something they did. All right. So I, I did not plan this, but this is a ridiculously good entree into the third law, the golden rule. You just said it, and you, I don't even know if you knew you said it, but you, the, the folks that have the gold make the rules, don't That's they? True. That's right. Well, isn't that true about the qualified plans we just got done talking about? Does the government technically own that money at this point? I think it's a liability on their books, <laughs> right? Because at, at, at the end of the day, that percentage of the money that's in there is theirs. That's right. They get to dictate to you how much of it you get to keep. Yeah. Because I, of they're in charge of the rules. How can I do the stretch IRA? Can I, how much do I, can I take out in a certain year? How much do I have to take out in a certain year? Think about the required minimum distributions that are in, involved in these things. So bringing that back, the golden rules, he who has the gold makes the rules. And we know this to be true, right? We know this to be true about other things. We can get off the qualified plan train. Just go to mortgages, right? You want to take a mortgage 100%. out? <laughs> Who has the gold? How many and stacks boy, of paper do I have to fill out and, for? You, and and right? you have to do every one of them because they've got the gold. You're trying to get access to it. And that puts us into the place of where we want to be, right? Why are we not trying to control the gold? And that's what Nelson was saying is that the, the way of becoming your own banker is a stress-free, peaceful way of life. And the reason was is that he didn't have to worry about other dictating the rules to him. I think as a society, we've abdicated so many things to others 
Oh, we've no quit question. trying to learn. We've gone, oh, I'm not smart enough to do that. I can't do that. No, maybe you don't need to do that, but you probably should know a little bit about it. I was on the phone call with somebody earlier today and, and <laughs> we were talking about different things and, and they're doing pretty well. And I said something, you know, like a lot of times we don't need to do that. We probably can pay somebody. And, and the wife was like, yep, we need to be paying somebody to do this or that. <laughs> and I said, so if we're going to start hiring a bunch of people, we better start becoming experts in hiring, right? Maybe we don't need to know everything there is about that, but why is it that we don't know what, you know, we need to know about how to hire the right people. That's right. So the other part about this that I, I think is important is that some people look at this whole process, they say, well, I mean, how do you become your own bank? Like the reason I go to a bank now is because I don't have the money set aside for a house, let's say. And that just seems like such a big thing. Well, Nelson doesn't make this out to be like overnight. No. Right. In fact, he said, how long did it take him? 17 years to get rid of the quote unquote snakes and dragons he talks about? Yeah, the banks. Yep. Yeah. To be able to take over the banking funds. He says on average, it might take 20 to 25 years, but who cares? If you're not on the process to replacing the bank, then you're always going to be required to play by their rules. No doubt. The golden rule will always be in effect for you. And this is the, I think leads us into the fourth human problem, which is the arrival syndrome. And this is a big issue. I mean, I, I can attest to my fault in this from the very beginning. Whenever I was an investment advisor, I thought I had all the knowledge that you could have as it related to finance, right? I became a CFP, Certified Financial Ooh. Planner. I mean, boy, I'd taken an exam that most people, one, wouldn't want to sit through, right? It was a day and a half. And, and, and then uh, over half of the people that take it fail it, right? So, boy, I've got all of this knowledge. You can't teach me anything at this point. I, Absolutely. I mean, I, I got it. And, and I went to these conferences, and I'd hear Nelson Nash actually he'd be at one of these conferences, and I'd say, man, that seems really interesting. What are they talking about? Somebody said, oh, that's whole life insurance. And I'd just go, nah. So Pass. Dumb, so dummies, man. <laughs> I mean, they're not smart enough to use investments, securities. I mean, if they were, they'd be doing what I'm doing. The reason they're selling whole life insurance and people are using whole life insurance because they just are not smart. They don't have enough brain power to do, you know, like everything I've got. Well, that there is a big issue when it comes to arrival syndrome that we have to wake up to is that information is constantly being created. Yeah. I, I have a lot of physician clients and I was talking one the other day and she said to me, she goes, you know, the thing in medicine is that all information continues to be new. It constantly is happening. I mean, we're always having to go back and tell our patients something new. And it's because as new research is done, we, it may counteract or uh, completely um, do away with the old information that we were using. That's right. And I think that's the way we should be in life is that making mistakes is not a problem. And that's what we're taught in schools is that we have to memorize things in order to get 100%. No, making mistakes are not a problem. Not admitting mistakes, I do think that's a problem. Or, or not learning from them. Right. right. Which I'm going to go ahead and plug this. If you haven't already joined our community, this is the whole purpose, right? Go, ahead, go to community.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com so you can be amongst people who are constantly in a learning environment. They are constantly challenging what they think. They're bringing their quote unquote failures to the group and saying, hey, tried this. This is what happened. And someone's saying, you know what? I did the same thing. This is what I did. What are, you, what are you going to do next? This is where we're interacting. We have the community aspect, but we also have a ton of education. You were talking about Q&As with our podcast guests. Um, we're talking about going deep on issues like infinite banking and really taking this to the next level. So you need to be in a position to continue to, to learn. Otherwise, you are going to be in this arrival syndrome. I was listening to a podcast on my way in this morning and the, the author, he's written, I don't know, 12, 15 books on business. And he said that at his peak, he was reading about 100 books a year. And now he says, I have three kids. I don't get to read 100. I only read about 50. <laughs> Think about that. How many people are reading five books a year, much less 50? It, the we are at some level got to a point where we say, I'm just too busy. 
and maybe the reading now has moved to Audible because I know most of the things that I read, quote unquote, read are through Audible. And I'll right. go back and read a hard copy if I really like it. But there's a, an area that we've got to get better in. We've got to learn that that we we are learning animals, as Nelson would say. We need to continue to consume information, apply it. Not all the information, and that's my problem, is I'll read something, I'll be like, I don't like that, what they said there, but oh, I do kind of like this. And I had a friend that had a you know country friend that said, you know, just treat it like a watermelon, eat the, eat the meat, spit out the seeds kind of thing. Yeah, you always got a one line or something. <laughs> but that's but we have to be learners. We have to be consuming information because once we get to the point of arriving in knowledge, then that's when we fit our failure. Well, and not to mention this, I just as a fair warning, I don't want you to be in the position of so many people that they think they've got it figured out, and then all of a sudden it takes a catastrophe to learn. Oh, like yeah. oops. I should have known this. I did not pay attention and oh, the market crashed and I've got a 201k. Well, that's kind of what it, it did for me. I had that, so many people I had that awakening, that right? That's what made me go seek new information. And we continue. I mean, I, w- what we're talking about today and the, the podcast is completely different than what we were doing earlier. We're moving to a, commu- a community teaching model, right? Like, where it's like, how do we get more resources for you as a client? How do we help you learn? Because really, you are your greatest asset. If you're not investing in yourself, this arrival syndrome is where you fail. Exactly. If you're investing in yourself, you're never hitting the arrival syndrome. And I think that's powerful. He he uses this Surfering's uh, Drake quote in here, and I won't read the whole thing, but there was one part of it that stuck out to me as we were preparing for the podcast. It says, Disturb us, O Lord, when the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the, the waters of life. And I'll, I think of that as a relationship to success because you're listening to this podcast because you're successful. You're, you're probably, you probably own a business. You're probably investing in things. You're probably creating uh, cash flows from assets. The thing that will creep up and get us though sometime is when we go, "Mm, I got this thing figured out. Got it whipped. It's it's, nothing could be better than this point. And I think that's when I look at that quote is disturb us, O oh Lord, when we've gotten to this point to keep pricking us to go, no. And it's not about acquiring more. It's not about being more successful. It's about, you know, I was listening to that podcast this morning. The guy was saying, how do we work 40 hours a week and go on vacation 10, uh, 10 weeks out of the year? So that way we're spending more time with our families where we're making a bigger impact on the world, where we're not you know, that they say right now, I mean, there's so many uh, statistics showing we're working 60, 70, 80 hour weeks as owners of businesses. And whether that's inside the office or that's slipping a little text messages <laughs> at the dinner table or slipping off to the bathroom to respond to a couple of emails when we're supposed to be on vacation at the lake. You, I mean, these are things <laughs> that happen. We all yeah. know that's happening. It's we, we've got to try to figure out how do we get better in that? How, how can we be more successful and work less? That's right. All right. So that was the arrival syndrome. The last one he talks about is use it or lose it. Okay. And this is, this is critical. So talking about overcoming human nature, people are using their own cash and not the policies that they've created. This is a big problem. When we have these policies, we can use them or we can lose them. Right. And what, what we talked about before is like a lot of our business owners have retained earnings and they're sitting on 100,000, 200, 250,000. That's just in their business because they like to have a cushion, which I totally get that. We need that. But when we don't use that money, we don't put it in the right place. What's it, what's it really going to cost us? And even as, as part of this use it or lose it is use the knowledge. We just got finished saying don't be arrived in knowledge. Don't get to an end of your learning. It's we have to keep applying it. So this is the application That's right. of the knowledge that we possess and that we're possessing is that don't lose that. Because just like anything, if I quit using my right arm, if I tied my right arm to my side for the next six months, what would happen to my right arm? It'd be all the muscle tone would go away. It would start atrophy, right? Yeah, the muscle, muscles in it would atrophy. Well, the same thing is true with our financial IQ, the, the financial tools that we have. We need to use them. 
Now, we talk about life insurance. Most people don't ever want to use life insurance right? <laughs> because using it equals death in their eyes. And in most insurances, like think about car insurance, That's you right. think about health insurance, uh, homeowner's insurance, the more you use them, what happens? They cut you. <laughs> you gone. <laughs> the, the worse they get, right? But the what we do, the, the better, these products actually perform better when we use them because we create income streams with it to allow us to buy more of them. Right. Allows us to have, have a larger storehouse, wealth, warehouse for our wealth, as Nelson would say. So using our money is super important. And, and there's this knowledge. We got to use that knowledge. And he goes through and he talks about a concept called EBA economic value added. And this was a really key concept that he kind of brought out in this book. And he's talked about how uh, businesses were not uh, taking the, the principle of my cash, my capital has a cost. So they literally were starting up new businesses and just taking cash out of their retained earnings account that you talked about a second right. ago and would go build the building with it or go buy a big, huge piece of equipment. And they couldn't really understand the the value of that new purchase, the new um, process that they were doing because they didn't have the expense if a, they would have had borrowed that money from a bank. And when they started applying that, so if they said, oh, well, I'm going to use 500000 to uh, start up this new building, then I'm going to start charging myself 8% interest. Well, well wait, a second, wait a second, this new venture doesn't look as good because cash flow doesn't work out. And that's how many of us have done that. We've went and bought something, a car, a boat, whatever it may be with cash. It's like, I can afford that. Right. Well, because I have the cash, I can afford it. Yeah. But if it came with a $600 a month payment and you go, wait well, a second, I can afford that or $1,500 a month payment or whatever the number is, uh, that, that would check yourself. Right. And that's what he's talking about. You have to assign value to your capital. And that's what we're talking about, retained earnings. If you just had your retained earnings in one place, and you kept that amount of money. It's not about the fact that, oh, well, if I, if I didn't have this, I'd have to borrow money to run my business. It's also, and this is just what Nelson says, you either pay interest or you lose interest that you should have earned. And so that retained earnings, you and I did some calculations the other day, at 4% over 30 years, $250,000 worth $810,000. Here's the thing. That's it, huge. It, you, at one point, started your business with no money in the bank. And you probably started taking it negative. <laughs> and, and you worked through a handful of years where you, know, you probably had to put money out of your own pocket, whether it's from a loan from another entity, in order to keep the thing afloat, to make payroll, to do all these things. And, and you, you were like, man, I don't ever want to go back to that point. So as soon as you started getting profitable, you started accumulating money in the business checking account. It became like this... Uh, this success piece to you, like man, security I, blanket. <laughs> I got, I got two hundred thousand dollars in my my business checking account. Now you already pay tax on it, unless you happen to be a C corp, which most people aren't. It, you you already pay tax on it, so I'm just sitting on this money. I'm just sitting there. But you know, there's times where we have ebbs and flows, and I have to use some of that. But and then it goes back, and and that's where you and I said, yeah, wait a second, what's the true cost of that? Because it's earning zero at the bank. If we could just have three, four percent on that. That's right. That's like five hundred and fifty, six hundred thousand dollars difference. Well, what is it that we could do with six hundred thousand? Could we retain more employees? Could we use it as a, a tool to help us expand and grow the business so it can actually be sellable for a, a larger amount in the future? I mean, there's so many things that when we look at this concept of infinite banking, we need to use it. Because otherwise, we not only lose the ability, as I gave the ARM example, but also we lose out on what the money would have earned for us in the end. So the, the key takeaway on use it or lose it is the process of infinite banking is a way of life. And Nelson says it specifically in the book. And I think that it was kind of a lightning bolt moment for me is that this isn't a product, right? If it was a product, it would be simple everybody would do it. How many times do you have somebody ask you, Russ, well, why, if this is so good, why isn't everybody doing it? Yeah. Because everybody cannot make this a way of life. It's they they, they just want to abdicate it. They just want to buy a product and put it on a shelf and say, okay, take care of me. I can't. And that's not going to happen. I, I'm, I'm listening to Robert Kiyosaki's book, Fake, right now. Yeah. And he says, oftentimes, he, he speaks all around the country on different things that he's doing with money. He says, somebody will stand up in the crowd and say, oh, you can't do that here. 
or I can't do that. And he says, well, maybe you can't, but I can. It's because I have different education, right? Doctors go to medical school, right? If you want to fly, you go to flight school. Joey, if you want to be rich, where you go? Rich school? <laughs> that, that's the question most people can't answer is because they don't know. They probably can't because they haven't increased their financial IQ to a point where they can. And this is where I, I believe the way we continue to learn, we, we implement these or recognize these human factors exist, these human problems exist, and we may not master them because we're going to keep learning. But when we acknowledge them, we put them forefront, and then we continue to find ways to get over and around them. We're going, as he would say, be measured against everyone else that are out there. And when we don't have to be selling when everyone else is selling, when the market is crashing, then we can be the ones that are buying at that point. And we can be winners in that long-term game. All right. So we have just concluded uh, our seventh part of this book. Join us for the next one. We're going to dive into creating the entity of your own banking system, specifically how we do that in life insurance. So join us on the next one. Thanks for joining us today and we'll catch you on the next one. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.